Board Chapel at Downers Grove Grade School, District 58 Board of Education here on Monday, October 26th at 7 4 p.m. at Indian Trail School. This meeting is also being live streamed for the public on District 58. Melissa, will you please call me? Here. 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 This evening, members of the audience will have an opportunity for extended public comment with the board later on in the agenda. The board asks anyone wishing to comment to fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. Please be placed in the basket on the table over to the right. Members of the public who are viewing remotely may provide a public comment by calling 630 743 4085 recording their comments. Comments will be accepted until we reach the public comment portion of the agenda. We will play all comments and remotely in the We have a lot of 30 minutes for public comments. Should there be time remaining, we will take any additional comments. So let's get started today with the flag stand. Thank you very much. As we go through the workshop this evening, we're going to discuss all of the things that we would typically discuss at the fall curriculum workshop. We're going to talk about school report cards, fall data, curriculum committee updates, where we're at with all of that, and school improvement plan. As is true of just about everything in 2020, not one of those bullets hasn't been impacted in one way or another by the pandemic. And so we'll talk about what we, where we are at this year, which in all cases is a little unique to where we would have been at in a typical year. So beginning with the report cards. Each year, the school report cards through the Illinois State Board of Education are released on or about October 30th to the public. And that's when the data is able to be publicly discussed. So we typically preview some of the concepts behind the report card at this meeting, and then talk specifically to our district data at the November board meeting, and we will follow with that. However, much of the information that we typically spend time reviewing and discussing will not be included as part of this year's school report card because of the suspension of in-person instruction last spring and all of the things that flowed from that. So for example, the state assessment did not take place last year. So there will be no IAR data, there will be no DLM data, there will, there will be no ISA data, all of those first few. Because there was no Illinois assessment of readiness, there will be no growth percentile there. We won't have assessment participation rates and the five essential survey was not, the window was not completed before all of the suspension of in-person instruction. So none of that data will be included on this year's report. Similarly, we typically talk at this time about ESSA designations. For the, this will be the third year that each individual school will be given a, a, a summative designation through the Every Student Succeeds Act. However, because much of the data used to calculate those designations is not available this year, a waiver was applied for and received by the state. And so all of the designations are simply carrying over exactly as they were from one year to the next. So the state is meeting the requirement of providing those designations, but they are identical to the previous year and using all of the data from that previous year. And so as you look at the, the chart on the screen now, this is exactly what we showed a year ago at this time, and it will simply carry through. It is again, based on data that is now a year and a half old and, and has no bearing on the on last school year. It simply will be the designation that will be listed for each school on this year's report. There are other calculations that are being done. They call it calculated with concern. And these are metrics that will appear on the school report card. However, they are not necessarily within the same ranges or averages that is we typically see. And all of those metrics were impacted, both the actual measurements and the reporting mechanisms, by the way each individual school district responded to the suspension of in-person instruction. So all of the bullets under calculated with concerns will appear on the report card, and we'll talk more about those at the regular board meeting in November. But ISB is cautioning us to recognize that they are, they're providing them. 
consistency of the, of the measurement is not the same as it would be in a suspension. And then those last two, they're actually saying even with the suspension of in-person instruction, those two are falling within the typical range that they're seeing. So when we see that metric of eighth graders passing out over one and the average phase of E per week, those will also be on the report card and calculated with a greater degree of confidence. There are also some new metrics on the report card this year. One of those is a series of, of gifted metrics. This is the first time that the state report card is going to include a number of questions around gifted eligibility and assessment and identification. Unfortunately, that data was not correctly captured by ISBE from District 58. So this year, our report card will simply show no data for those categories. Um, doubly unfortunately, there's always a, a window of time when the district administration can preview the data and, and ensure that something like this wouldn't happen, that it would be calculated correctly. Unfortunately, this is a new metric for ISBE. It was not included in that data preview. So the first moment that we've learned that we will not have data in this category was once the data has already been finalized and released under embargo to the district. Uh, the report card will also reference the Illinois Youth Survey, which is something that we don't currently participate in, and it will also uh, reference the KIDS survey data. KIDS is a kindergarten readiness assessment. So in a typical year, that is an assessment that is made up of observations taken within the first 40 days of school. So for us, it really is a measurement of where our students are as they enter District 58 kindergarten. Obviously, some of our students come from Grove Children's Preschool, but not that. So it's a, it's a measure of readiness for kindergarten at that point in time. And we can talk more about those measurements again in November. So as we move on then, the next thing we want to cover this evening is fall math data. As the board is well aware, students in grades two to eight were assessed over a three-week period remotely with, in the areas of reading and mathematics. We did not assess kindergarten and first grade at this time remotely, primarily due to the technological constraints of having to lock out of everything else and have no communication with their teacher because in kindergarten and first grade, that assessment is delivered orally where the students are on headphones and have to listen to the questions being read aloud. Um, we also factored in the idea that kindergartners would never have seen this assessment before and first graders would have seen it only once before. And so it was, it was a decision to wait on this until hopefully we can do it together at the winter session. We're going to send those scores home at the end of this week for our students in grades two through eight, and that will include their fall score as well as most recent historical data of both math and reading in math. As we go into the data, I want to again say, as we kind of previewed at the last um, regular meeting, we need to be careful that we are interpreting this data set cautiously. Any one data set should always be reviewed as just that, one set of data at one moment in time. So we've really taken uh, a good look at data over time as a district. In this moment, um, we will, we're looking at a unique set of data for a few reasons. One is that this was given remote. And so that brings a number of environmental inconsistencies with it, just as, as, a, as, as a natural outgrowth of remote learning and remote assessment. There were technological issues, probably not any more than we would see on site, but the ability to immediately troubleshoot and solve those is different when you're operating in a remote environment. We're also in an environment where students are not with their teachers as they're taking those assessments. And so when a, a parent or a daily caregiver might see a child struggling with a question on an assessment, their parental reaction might be a little bit different than what it, how, the way a teacher might react in the same situation. Not to say one is cold and one is warm or to draw a strong parallel, but the, the, the way a student is supported by their parent may look and feel different than the way a student is supported by their teacher. And so all of those things can factor into that assessment experience and what that can look like for us. It's not to say the data isn't valid or isn't worth considering. It's to say when we look at it, we need to make sure that we are taking all of these environmental factors into consideration. Um, we're gonna talk a bit on the next slides about the norms, which are another reason we have to look carefully at this data. And then again, typically at this time, we would be presenting growth data as well as achievement data. At this moment, we don't have a metric that we can look back to this fall data because as you will recall, last school year, we elected to remove the fall benchmarking period in an effort to keep to get instruction going more readily and use that prior spring data, which was a, a well-grounded decision if you weren't anticipating a pandemic. Um, obviously in this case now, we do have some distance between the data sets for the fall and we don't have fall of 2019 
data set to compare. So growth data will be something we'll be talking about. I mentioned the norms have changed. And so in, in, in short, those norms that NWEA uses are what give us those national percentages. So to be able to say that my RIT score of 204 as a fourth grader in math is at the 50th percentile, that's all derived from the norms. And every number of years, NWEA does an, an additional norming study to make sure that they are using the most current data that's out there. So by looking at somewhere between three and five million student samples, they have studied and, and determined where those median percentiles fall. So they find that median, that 50th percentile of all of those assessment samples from, from all of those students, and they reset them. This is the first time they've done it since 2015. And there are some things that NWA themselves have shared in terms of what the differences are in those numbers. In general, student achievement is declining nationally over this last five years. So not drastic not terrifyingly, but enough that a student who scored a 204 in math this year versus a student who scored a 204 in math last year at the same time might yield a different percentile. Their actual score on the assessment is identical, but because the norms have changed, the same score with 2020 norms may see a higher or more likely will see a higher percentile than when using the 2015 and so this is a moment that we have to remember as we are looking to interpret both current and historical data, because now historical data that's coming out on reports will reference the 2020 norms. So it's possible that you could look at the printout of your child's map scores from last year and then look at them from this year and see different percentiles for the same exact scores because of this norming change. So this is a moment that NWEA has made that shift, and that is the way we will look at scores going Again, nothing that invalidates past scores and nothing that invalidates current scores. But one more thing we have to consider as we're looking both at, at data from an individual level all the way up to the district. So these are our median achievement percentiles in reading and math this fall. And so you can see those, that, again, that the median is, that is the, the median percentile of all of our second graders in reading, second graders in math, et cetera. Looking at it in isolation, there are some rather high percentiles on there. You know, one in the 60s and everything else above the 70s. So that's exciting when you first look at that. And then we can look at our historical percentiles. So we'll start with reading. And just to make sure we're looking at the chart correctly, as you look across, it's second grade at that moment in time as you read horizontally. And then as you follow the color coding, that would be the same group of students as they move through time. Again, noticing that we have that gap between fall of 18 and fall of 20, so that we always jump down an extra line. Now again, I began by saying we have to interpret this data with caution. I would love to be able to say, look at us, we're in the third year of a reading curriculum implementation. Our numbers are jumping up. If you follow the cohorts, they're almost all moving. I, I think you, you could get really excited about this. And yet I also want to just say, like we say with any set of data, it's one moment in time. There are some anomalies and, and the norms have shifted a little bit. So we're going to take this and digest it and then also look for our winter data, which will inform how, what this really means for us as we go forward. Similarly with math, here's a comparison historically. Again, we can see some, some significant jumps at certain grade levels and for certain cohorts and some consistency at others. And again, th that consistency could say that maybe there is some validity saying there is that consistency shows us, yes, this is really reliable. I think, again, we want to be careful to take a good look at what this looks like over time and how it relates to it. So lots that is telling us we're heading in a good direction if we look at it that way. Lots of numbers that say we are seeing some consistent fall performance. Again, we're two years removed from the last fall data, but all of it interpreted with the 2020 lens of remote assessments, new norms, a variety of instructional experiences over the, the past six months. So moving forward then, obviously this data will be looked at at the building level with the same cautionary degree that we are talking about here. And then we'll have our winter benchmarking period, which this year will be in January of 2021. And after that point, 
we will have growth data and other sets of data to be able to examine more further. The other piece that we need to take a look at is a review of our key performance indicators. Many of those are map driven, four of the six use map data in, as part of our strategic plan. And those are targets that were set three years ago and are, are, have a finish line essentially of this spring. And so it's not a question of do we need to adjust them? Do we need to change them? Do we need to reconsider them? We just, like everything else, want to take a look at what that means now with new norms, with our, our current data sets, and, and what that might tell us. And so we're going to have that conversation with the Curriculum Council, which is the group that really was born out of strategic planning and had some initial conversations around setting those targets. We're going to hopefully bring it to our Differentiation and Assessment Committee, the group that looks at our data and assessment plans as a district. We're going to work with NWA themselves. They offer a number of consultative services. We don't necessarily annually take them up on that, but this year we're intending to work with our, our representatives and see what they can provide for us in terms of another level of analysis. Um, the administrative team will review it. And then at the December, or at the, excuse me, the November district leadership team meeting, which is where the strategic plan updates typically happen, we'll have a conversation when we talk about goal one updates around those key performance. I'm now going to ask um, Mrs. Christine Priester to come forward and talk a little bit about our math adoption and where we're at today. Good evening. As you know, we adopted a new math curriculum for our kindergarten through fifth grade students this year. Ideally, it was probably not the perfect year to implement this as it's a heavy hands on curriculum, but honestly, our teachers are blowing it out of the water. Um, this year, we started off with professional learning that picked off picked up after last spring, and we also supplemented with more professional learning on how to adapt the hands-on curriculum in a remote environment. Um, our, at the district level, we're supporting teachers with instructional recommendations for both remote instruction and socially distanced on-site instruction. Um, at the beginning of the year, we purchased individual student manipulatives for all of our students that we um, really came together as a staff across the district to put together in a matter of days and send home. So every student had what they needed to um, engage with the curriculum as it was designed. Um, this year we're um, prioritizing instructional coaching support for Bridges. And we last Wednesday in the Community 58, we um, put out our first parent education video with the goal and purpose of giving an overview of the curriculum to parents, a little snapshot of what it looks like in the classroom. And as we publish more videos, our goal is to highlight those key shifts in that instruction for our parents. So I'm going to go ahead and share that video with you now. Hello, District 58. I'm Justin Sissel, the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. District 58 has adopted a new math curriculum for this school year for our kindergarten through fifth grade students, which is called Bridges in Mathematics. Bridges is a comprehensive curriculum that is as engaging as it is mathematically powerful. We're so excited about the instruction and learning that we've already seen this school year and can't wait to see where the year takes us in math for our District 58 students. I'd now like to introduce Mrs. Christine Priester, one of our curriculum coordinators, who will share more about this exciting new program. Bridges has three main components, number corner, workplaces, and math sessions. Each of the three components offer students a chance to learn math through direct instruction, guided discovery, and exploration. Bridges creates a classroom environment that fosters rich math discussion that is accessible to all levels of learners to share their math discoveries, explain their methods, and ask questions. Next, I'll tell you a little bit more about each of the components during remote learning. Number Corner is a daily program that reviews and previews skills and strategies students will encounter across the curriculum. Students interact with anchoring workouts that revolve around a calendar, number line, as well as other visuals and manipulatives through the grades. Students will also engage in daily math sessions where students investigate a carefully crafted set of problems that allow them to experience a variety of problem solving strategies through a combination of teacher modeling and sharing of math thinking and strategies with their classmates. High quality math visuals and hands on manipulatives are an essential part of learning. The last component is Bridges Workplaces. 
Workplaces are puzzles and games that reinforce key concepts and skills. The class will learn and collect workplaces for each unit and continue to play them for the next six weeks. If you are interested in learning more about the program, please visit themathlearningcenter.org. On the Families page, you simply select your child's grade and you can learn more about their yearly goals, unit topics, and visual strategies your child will be using this year. This year is our sixth to eighth grade math program, Big Ideas. Um, just like with Bridges at the beginning of the year, a teacher can do with their professional learning on the series. Um, Big Ideas Math also has a pretty robust online component that's only been available this year for both asynchronous and remote instruction that teachers can keep professional development on. Um, across the district, we've provided several opportunities for sixth grade teachers across our elementary schools. And to collaborate either in person or over Zoom to share strategies for synchronous instruction, asynchronous, and the best, best instructional strategies for remote instruction. Um, I have to tell you, I am thrilled with both of these programs in the classroom, whether it's been over Zoom or walking with the classrooms last week. I'm really blown away at the level of math conversation and discussion that our students are sharing, whether it's in a first grade classroom or a sixth grade classroom. I think these two programs are going to Good evening. A little bit of background before we get into the slide. Um, social studies is certainly ready for the update. There's no doubt about it. And an update in resources um, will certainly assist our staff in meeting the Illinois social science standards and the Illinois mandates. So we are very excited. Uh, we are planning to pilot two new resources this fall um, in grades K through eight. The two new resources chosen by the social studies uh, committee to pilot were from McGraw Hill and Pearson. That's a little bit of background. What's happening now? Well, all middle school social studies teachers and some of our sixth grade teachers are currently piloting a resource from McGraw Hill. Um, what happened is with the pandemic, the social studies committee decided to hold off on the K-5 pilot. So um, but we wanted to go forward with the grade six through eight pilot. So that's why they are in process now of piloting the two resources. You can see our timeline um, on the slide. Again, K-5 decided to wait and they're gonna go forward in the fall of 2021. What's next? Well, after using both resources, McGraw-Hill and Pearson, our pilot teachers, again, grades six through eight, uh, will meet to evaluate and also review student input. A resource will then be chosen to recommend the board. The Social Studies Committee will also begin planning for the pilot of those two resources with grades K to five in the fall of 2020. Uh, in conclusion, it is an exciting time uh, to be addressing our social studies curriculum. I think I'm really excited about it. I think the committee is excited about it. The uh, Illinois social science standards emphasize uh, a, rigor a rigorous discipline knowledge in areas of civics, economics, history, geography. And it also puts uh, students more in the driver's seat in their learning. Um, so the inquiry emphasis in social studies, much, much like our science curriculum, is really inviting our students to uh, ask questions, uh, find answers to those questions, and then share their understanding to the wider audience. So we look forward to addressing the curricular needs in social studies uh, this year with our middle school and hopefully next year with our elementary so that we are better resourced to meet those standards and mandates and to more effectively serve our students. I want to just acknowledge for a moment our two curriculum coordinators and recall that this position is, is just in its second year at this point in time. I want to say to the board and to our community that 
the addition of these curriculum coordinator positions in, in conjunction with our instructional coaching team is one of the is the reason that we are able to successfully maintain the curriculum adoption schedule, the pilot schedule that supports the teachers right now with all of the different models and all of the different lesson creations. I just want to express my gratitude for the willingness to see the vision moving forward of adding to the curriculum department in a way that will support all of the things we are continuing to try to accomplish. So thank you for that. Before I go past that slide, the other piece of social studies that is um, talked about often right now is current events instruction. And I want to acknowledge that that is a, a, a mandated part, actually, of our social studies curriculum and our curriculum in general, obviously at developmentally appropriate levels. This is a presidential election year, and we would be derelict if we didn't discuss the process behind a presidential election and all of those things. But it's also important to acknowledge that this is a presidential election that we know has polarized our nation and, and our community by extent. And so it's just an important moment to recognize that as we do talk about current events and things like the election, we do so from a neutral standpoint, advocating not for or against any particular side or issue. And then I've just taken a moment to share the bullets from our school board policy to talk about the questions that we think the should be considered controversial, acknowledging that they will be obviously aging appropriate to curriculum and type of curricular resources and, and everything balanced, respectful, and obviously not tolerant of anything that doesn't need to be. The Curriculum Council met once this year. Um, meetings at this point are, are via Zoom and are a little bit briefer in terms of the amount of hours that are left in the day. Um, and really at the Curriculum Council talk about where are we at now? What, if we look at our strategic plan goals around curriculum and around learning, what should we be focusing on? We're talking about that parent education piece to what's happening now. Christine showed me one of the early examples of other things we're beginning to put together around that. Um, we also talked about recognizing that there have been interruptions to this home. Like, like Matt said, the, the taking on of a K-5 pilot for our elementary teachers who are already um, implementing a brand new hands-on math curriculum and all of that, it's a, I believe it's a wise recommendation by the committee, and I think it's a good decision by our administrative team, but it does now change some of those timelines that the curriculum council worked so hard to set up. So over the course of this year, we, we don't want to simply slow down as a response to all of that, but we need to be thoughtful about what that means. Technically, we are coming up to the point where a small group should be looking at our ELA and making some decisions about what our future steps would be, and that seems awful soon. Another conversation for the curriculum council in the months, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, discussion around the The other reality is that this is the meeting where typically we would give an update on the STEM committee, the ELA committee, the Blue Language Committee, and all of those other groups that simply have not met at this point in the school year. Um, there's, there's really not a scenario in the near future that I expect we would be asking teachers to get half day substitutes to attend the meeting. That's the structure we have typically used hold these committee meetings, that does not align with our priorities right now in the moment. So there are hours here and there that we can capture via Zoom, and I, and I don't anticipate seeing these committees uh, postponed the entire year, but we are prioritizing the work and the conversation and, and what's happening. So as of right now, those committees have not met. I would expect that by the time we come back around in February, we will have at least had some conversations with all of those groups to check in on where all of those go. The last piece that I want to address tonight is the school inclusion planning process, which again is, is traditionally part of this curriculum. So for this school, each of our buildings has developed a plan with four consistent goal areas. The goals themselves are not identical, but the goal content areas are consistent. And so the, the first is reading achievement. The second is math achievement. The third is that math curriculum implementation. Again, something we know that we will all be working on, and so that's a consistent goal. And then finally, the communicating or collaborating or telling your school's story goal. Three of the four are consistent goal areas from prior years. We added the math curriculum implementation for this year. So each of those building plans then will be reviewed with building staff and with families through the PTA. And we will be having each building take a look at those after each benchmarking period, so that in January and in May, to see where we are at in terms of those goals and what's how well we have done with implementing the steps that we had talked about. So 
for all intents and purposes, as you are all veteran board members, this is the same structure, the same school improvement planning process that we have engaged in for the past few years. I'll, I'll use that as the transition into, we have been talking about revising and enhancing the school improvement planning process. And this is another COVID impact where had we not lived through a pandemic, we would have been uh, implementing what's called the cycles of cycles, excuse me, of inquiry approach to school improvement planning. We were intending to be talking about that right now. Um, this is work that we're doing in conjunction with the Regional Office of Education. And our entire district administrative team has gone through training. We did maintain that training even through last spring, virtually via Zoom, to be able to engage in this process. And cycles of inquiry, I, I kind of quoted the definition there, but it, it really is uh, a way to look at problem identification, problem solving, and looking at things at the individual building level that may be impacting students' achievement. The, the thorough explanation of cycles of inquiry is much more detailed, and we're going to save that for the May board meeting when we can talk about not only the process, but where we're at. Because as you can see the timeline on the screen behind me, we are looking to continue moving toward the implementation of this process. So our building leaders will be engaging in some ongoing training and collaboration and sort of building implementation steps as we go forward so that as we reach the spring when we truly begin the school improvement planning process for the 2021-22 school year this this will be the way we approach that school improvement process and so that brings me to the end of tonight's workshop presentation again typically we would have a number of additional committees and, and additional data sets and this year at this moment, this is what we have to present. So I'm happy to take questions from the board at this point in time. Fantastic presentation as always. I do wanna upfront start with saying, um, Ms. Priester and, and Mr. Kimmel, thank you for the, uh, the continued work uh, moving forward the pilot programs that Mr. Kapsi could also uh, have to roll out. You did say this was a, a year you wouldn't necessarily do it, but uh, with us being in, in such a unique situation, have such a solid math program consistent across the district. I've been hearing a lot of positives from the parents. And, the, and so that points to the hard work that you guys are doing and the curriculum teams are, are doing to make sure that we um, have the knowledge and all of our staff's heads to make that happen. So I think we can say that. Uh, before I kind of pass it off, I do have a quick question. The numbers and the formulation that we're looking at here. One of the things that you did mention up front was that ultimately that benchmark changed of what we're trying to hit um, nationally. So when you look at our numbers, there is a, you get a positive feeling because there's a sort of a forward trajectory. So, I mean, you did allude to the fact that the grid scores may look different than we anticipate. Is there any looking that we're going to do at our kind of base grid scores and say, normally for a fifth grade, in the fall, we would kind of expect this so that we have an expectation of not how, they, how they're preparing nationally, but how they're preparing is where we would normally expect our students to be. Certainly, that is analysis that we can do. I mean, the, the, the map shift in norms is between, you know, point something and almost five percentile points, depending on grade and age, grade level and, and subject. So, so to be able to take a look, if, I, if I'm hearing the question correctly, to say, if I scored a 204 as a fourth grader this year, and if I scored, you know, what, what did our actual number look like last year as a median, as opposed to just a percentile? So looking at that, that's not data we typically have shared um, in any of the prior presentations, but it certainly is something we can pull together and, and take a look at and share with the board at a later date. Just to jump in there, NWA does offer a report in the The district summary report, and in that report, you can look historically to see, of course, you can see the percentiles and all those things, but you can also see the raw grid scores. And so, what would the grid um, the overall for the fall of 2020, fall of 19, fall of 18, uh, 19, we, we can test all students, so you, you really can't look at that. But, you know, just a quick glance of what you're looking at, you know, for instance, the fall of uh, 20, you had 186.1 with the mean grid for second grade, but we look at the fall of uh, 18, 184.1. So that's the kind of information that we continue to share, as Justin alluded to. Um, again, one of the cautions that I also want to extend to the board and the community is this is one snapshot in time under a very unique testing situation. And so as we look at the winter and the spring data, I think we'll get more. But we can certainly compare what our average risk score is, you know, in 
environment that the winter and spring as well, but we can get that report to the board. Well, and the rest of them speak for themselves. I, I think I'm asking the question now, not so much all numbers, but I'm curious, even more so, I think, in winter. We can do the January test in person in a more typical environment. Uh, this is less, this is not to be punitive in any way, but if you're looking at this from a national standpoint, I think that on a whole, our, our numbers are okay. But what I'd like to do, I think what's important is that not so much in the board, but that our, our teachers and our administration understand truly what the impact on, on learning was on these students. I mean, there was a very different learning method at the end of last school year, starting with a unique approach at the beginning of this year, transitioning into a hybrid model. So this is going to have a different kind of impact with the kids. And I think more than anything, I want to know, yeah, are we, that median number that we're looking at, mean number, are there, are there a specific block of kids that were, were greatly impacted by this? Maybe these numbers that we did remotely are not as accurate. This is a good look for us. This is a good idea. But if we get to do our winter one in person, and we have a winter one Last year, that may give us a little bit better um, historical background. Um, any questions for the board? So the, the plan is by the end of this week to send home paper copies to those students who are attending on site. So through whatever method that will be, back up or envelope, whatever. Um, and then for students who are not on site at the end of this week, either it will be emailed as a PDF file or it will be sent via US that will be a building office decision, whatever is more manageable in this week for that. Thank you. And not to um, be redundant, also, it was brought up at the last meeting, but for people that were specifically watching Absolutely. So there's the question about Squirrel, which is the place where typically for the past few years, families have gone to look for data and historical data. At this point, as a district, we've made a decision to no longer utilize that, uh, that data warehousing system. It just isn't efficient or sensible for us to continue operating at this time. We are working on ways that some of that information will be available digitally on a regular basis. Until we have that consistently available digitally for families, we will be sending home these paper reports. They do show historical data. There is, you know, if you have an eighth grader, candidly, you will not see every score down to, down to first grade on this particular report. But if that is something that any family is interested in, we can certainly generate that information and send it home separately. This report, I want to say, will give you the most, the, the 10 to 12 most recent assessments. So for most students, that's going to take them back four to five years. Worth of data. And this is the data, this is the paperwork that would come home historically in the past in the report cards, correct? Bundled up. Yes, this is, it, it is the exact same report that we've always printed. The, the, really, the look of it hasn't changed almost at all. Super, thank you. Just that, uh, Chris well, thanks for the presentation. Your team as well. um, I, I appreciate the focus on the core subject areas. I'd love, uh, I'd love to uh, engage in a conversation a bit about uh, something that our, our students have, have been asked to be resilient uh, over the last six to nine months and probably will be for the next school year uh, for, uh, for a while to come. I'd love to understand how we think about uh, social emotional curriculum, social emotional learning, and our students' mental health as it relates to our curriculum especially in the times that we're uh, currently in and might be in for a while, how do we think about where our students are when they're coming to us and how they're progressing uh, in a way that's aligned to what we want for the best things we want for each of our own kids? Thank you for the question. And yes, obviously, though, though not on a slide this evening, social-emotional learning and that curriculum remain a part of our plan within the, the current hybrid model that certainly is incorporated as a, a significant portion of the synchronous time that we have, the, the precious synchronous time that we have with our students. We want to make sure that both 
the, the, class, the, the, the responsive classroom pieces, the classroom meetings and things like that, as well as second step, which is our curriculum that explicitly teaches social emotional skills and meets those standards. Those are all being maintained as part of instruction right now. To your question around how do we know where students are, you know, at this point, we don't necessarily have that formalized assessment structure. It's something that we had talked about a while ago, and, and like everything else, that conversation has not come back around yet, primarily due to the pandemic. That assessment, though, that we were talking about last year wouldn't necessarily screen for immediate mental health issues. It's more about how are students growing in the skills and strategies that are taught as part of the curriculum. So in that sense, that is something that we intend to continue as a conversation in the, in the future at some point this year. Um, in terms of how are we monitoring student mental health, obviously our teachers are our first observers of those things as they've gotten to know students this year, if they're noticing differences or in behaviors or things like that. We certainly still have our school social workers who are available and middle school counselors to support those kinds of things. But, but at this point, it really is a big, it's why we talk about building relationships in all those classroom communities so that when you have those relationships, whether they're built remotely or in person, you can then start to see are there, are there differences in student behaviors and student responses? And then we can connect with families and with other school resources should we need to do that. Thank you, that was fantastic. All right, tonight the board has allotted 30 minutes for an extended opportunity for the board and communication. We ask that you keep your comments to about the three minute limit to allow everyone the opportunity. Any cards on there? All right, we have no cards. Go ahead and um, we have no. Is there anyone here that would like to make a public comment? Thank you. Um, tonight we have a couple of announcements. Uh, some dates that you take note of. Uh, Friday, November the 6th at 7 a.m. will be the Financial Advisory Committee. And then Monday, November 9th at 7 p.m. will be our next regular board meeting with that brings us to adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. All right, Melissa, will you please call roll? Aye. 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 The motion carried. The meeting is now adjourned here at 7.